a big applause for uh, like most prolific tweeter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do I have to? I really have to eat it? Right? You really? I, I think take it. I think really <laughs> take it. Not in a sexual way. Or just talk loudly. I'll just yeah. I'll just talk yeah, yeah. Okay. a little loud. Thank, thank you. So, um, so I wanted to. I just wanted to, to, to start by by pointing out this quote uh, by Antonio Negri: "Nothing is richer or finer than to be able to connect the immediate needs of an individual to the political needs of the class." Right. And, and on that note, again, thank you to Johannes for putting this presentation, for putting this conference on together. And I'll for all of them. <laughs> and also to Robert and Carol for hosting this space. I want to make sure I give them uh, honor and homage too for putting it, for allowing us to do this here. Right, so this year's this year's Arts Electronic Guy is screw the system. And on that note, I also want to thank the previous speakers that came before me, particularly the ones that were talking so much about about the various perceptions of of, uh, of social constructs. Um, you you guys are are a group of people whose minds are irrepressible. You people present ideas at places like this, and hopefully in the work you do elsewhere as well. That help create a kind of psychological liberty, a kind of space for possibility in the mind. This is really, really important. You guys are rebels of today and possible prophets of the future. Now, in contrast to that, we have the man. We have the system. The system wishes to maintain the status quo. They encourage stagnation. And how do they, how, how does that happen? Right. Class. Okay, so class generally. What is class? That's what we're here to talk about. High class, low class. Right. What class are you in? What is your first class? When was your second class? Do you like your classmates? Can you mate cross class? What makes you feel like a second-class citizen? Are you working class? Are you working in class? Did you even go to class today? <laughs> I did. <laughs> Classy. <laughs> okay, so class, I started, when I came to, to think about this talk, um, you'll have to forgive me because this is not a topic that I can talk about dispassionately. And so I changed the tone a little bit. Um, class, I, when I started to think about it, I went to the very, very beginning of the mathematics, the mathematic definition, which is just a set of things that are kept uh, separate from another set of things. Now, in social contexts, social classes are also very in, uh, intimately intertwined with an idea of social power. And when I started thinking about that, I started to talk. I started to look at um, the work of. I started to look at the work of Max Weber, who was a German sociologist and economic and uh, political economist in the very very early 1900s. And he he thought of class. Uh, he, he curated this 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 theory, academically called the three component theory of stratification, or more commonly known as Weberian stratification, that was founded upon these two different positions of power. On the one end, you have the possession of power. And this depends on the control of certain social resources, which we'll get into just in a bit. And the second bit is about the exercise of power, the ability to get one's way, often regardless of other people's uh, potential opposition. So together, the possession and the exercise of power, again, social resources, conflagrate this ability to get what one, what, what one wants. 
So now when we talk about the fear of sexuality, we often talk about the idea of sexual empowerment. And I think no one put this better than uh, Kristen Stubbs, actually, when she talked about uh, sexual empowerment from making toys. And she said, I don't believe that off-the-shelf sex toys or equipment can meet everyone's needs. Commercial products also tend to be very expensive, so DIY alternatives can help make toys more accessible. Promoting technological empowerment for sexuality and pleasure is about enabling people to build and modify objects around them so they can have the kinds of experiences that they want to have. It's a pretty basic idea, right? One should have the experiences they want to have. So sexual empowerment is the ability to have sexual experiences that one wants. Katie talked about this very eloquently just recently. Now let's talk about that in the context of the BDSM scene. Now when I say the scene, I have to be very specific. I'm using capital T, capital S, the scene. Specifically, I'm talking about the semi-public, pansexual, often middle class and privileged, public BDSM scene, right? Um, in her paper, Working at Play, BDSM Sexuality in San Francisco Bay Area, Margot Weiss defines these as such. Pansexual is a term used by the SM community to describe organizations, spaces, and scenes that are open to, used by, or include people of various sexual and gender orientations. In practice, the pansexual community in San Francisco usually means the community of practitioners who join and participate in organizations like Society of Ganis, SM Odyssey, take classes and workshops in places like QSM, attend munches and semi-public play parties, and otherwise participate in the formally organized scene, as she describes it at, at length, in general, the men are in the majority heterosexual, the women are bisexual and heterosexual, and there are a fair number of transgender practitioners and professional dominants of various orientations. Now she did a, 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 an ethnography, so she interviewed a bunch of individuals. And what I want to call out here is, in total, Margot Weiss says, I interviewed 51 practitioners, 27 men and 24 women, including two transgender women. Their average age was 41. They were 87% white, and most were involved in long-term relationships. 25% were married, 38% were partnered. Of my female interviewees, 50% were bisexual, 29% were lesbian, 15% were heterosexual. Of my male interviewees, 59% were heterosexual, 26% were bisexual, and 15% were gay. Almost all of my interviewees would be considered middle class based on <coughs> education, profession, and income. And 26% worked in the computer industry, or tech industry, <laughs> more than any other category, including other. <laughs> so, before we get too much further, it's really key to understand this particular distinction. That when I talk about the C and I am specifically talking about this community of people, whether they mean San Francisco or elsewhere, there are formalized structures, which I call the capital S C for now. You can think of this, uh, you can ask yourself some questions to see how closely associated you are with this particular group. For example, how many hours a week do you spend on, say, FetLife and or in BDSM email lists, uh, discussion lists about the topic? How many in which BDSM leather or scene organizations do you, are you involved with? Do you belong to? What percentage of your social life would you consider to be connected to that community, to the scene? How much money do you estimate you regularly spend on BDSM-related events or equipment or things like that, toys, services, etc.? Just think about that. It is okay if you do or do not. Um, and another way to look at it is to look around right now. Who do you not see here? I don't see a lot of dark-skinned people, black people. Some. <laughs> Disproportionately few. We see a lot of disabled people, people with disabilities. I don't see a lot of poor people. People who could not come because this has a price tag. It's a low price tag, which is worth congratulating you for. But it still has a monetary cost. I know people who couldn't be here today because they could not afford the $25 to get in the door. Now, I'm going to talk specifically about, I mean, you can put, you know, let's mention that. Look at my skin color. Look at my gender presentation. 
And it's worth noting also that I match although that I'm not a woman, and that I am able-bodied, etc. So we can but let's put all that aside. And instead, let me talk about submissive masculinity and the submissive masculine, because that's what I'm most most known. So now, in the scene, there is a shared culture, shared news, shared news outlets, shared informational outlets. And hearkening back to Adam's talk yesterday, for those who were there, this is very much like a nation state. Right? The collection of people for whom that realm comprises the majority of their social existence live in that particular kind of nation state. I call this the scene state. Capital S, capital S. <laughs> the scene state. It is an imagined communion. Right? And like any other modern society, it enforces social control on its citizens in particular ways. And that's what I'm really interested in. And when we think about how that happens, we can again look to Max Weber, we can look back to his, his theory of, of, of Weberian stratification. Because in it, he also discusses three individual components that comprise that kind of social control. He talks about wealth, which is the access to material resources, typically thought of as financial. Now, confusingly, he calls this class, which is an unfortunate terminology. He talks about uh, power, more formally political power. He calls this party. And he talks about stand, or status, social status. And these things are like, what, what is your gender presentation? How does that affect you? We talked a lot about this earlier. I'm not going to go over it again. But this can be mapped almost directly, I think, to the BDSM world, where wealth is, for example, big toy bags, or leathers, the right boots. Power and party is your scene affiliation. How many organizations are you part of? Are you on the boards of any organization? What decision-making power do you have in those organizations? What political clout does that give you? And status, role orientation. Top, dom. So, bottom, femme, masculine, presenting. Now, that's what I want to focus on because this is, of course, a class analysis of social status in the BDSM. And this gets very complicated because of the intersectionalities that are affected by it. But the most salient way to talk about it is to talk about something called domism, which is the prejudicing uh, against submissive identified individuals or bottom identified individuals and towards the normati normalizing the experiences of dominance. And Thomas Millar over Yes Means Yes is probably the most uh, um, eloquent on topic, and so I don't have more particular slides, but he calls this role essentialism and sexism intersectionality in the DSM scene. It's a highly, highly recommended read. And basically, he calls it the social structures within the sexual community that privilege dominance and devise submissives outside of explicitly negotiated power exchanges. It takes a lot of forms. Among them are the pathologizing of bottoms and subs, and non-play, role policing, and presumption. What these prejudices amount to, again, normalizing the experiences of the dominant. And this is not just his say-so. It's not just my say-so. There are numerous ethnographies, like Playing on the Edge by Stacey Newmar, a really, really good book, that talk about exactly this. And people have experienced these kinds of, these kinds of prejudices on, on, on a startlingly regular basis. Um, in this book, Newmar writes, uh, on page 79, um, specifically. She says here, the most ubiquitous example posits assertiveness as inconsistent with submission. Once I articulated a point in a heated conceptual debate, a member of the group asked me whether I was sure I was submissive. Another time I asked a companion, a top identified man, to order me my coffee while I went to the bathroom, pumped another person at the table to explain, hey, I thought you were a sub. So, this is this can be taken as a bunch of anecdotes from an individual perspective, but if we zoom out to the to the perspective of the nation state to see how the nation state sees things, right? This how the scene state views things. You can look at this and you, you can see this mirrored in a lot of in a lot of uh, a lot of ways. Uh, one of the biggest intersections is the privileging of the dominant experience as an expression of masculinity. So that masculinity itself becomes the way to express dominance, which is obviously frustrating for submissive men like me, and for dominant women, and for anyone who doesn't match into these boxes.
there's an enormous number of cultural scripts and tropes that we can ascribe to in order to get that kind of presentation to be, uh, to be, to be acknowledged. But what I want to show you is a prototypical example of how this relates to the, the wider world. I run a website called NelsonMakingArt.com. And here's a picture that I posted on it. It's pretty tame. And I saw this as a very loving and, and sensuous photograph. And um, I said here, let's see if we can zoom up a little bit. You know, tame photo, young couple, struck a chord in me. I love this image because me, the man's submission is all the more poignant in its simplicity. I saw love. And here's what someone else took. Same exact image. Pixel for fucking pixel. <laughs> <laughs> and here's their interpretation of the image. Silly boy, I may let you serve me, but I'll never love you. Is that enough? And he says, yes, mistress. Now, just it's the contrast in these two things. It's the contrast in the context, not the image, but the surrounding marketing material of this that pisses me off. Because this is all I get most of the time when I look at porn. Or when I look at sexual expression of any kind that tries to present itself as for and made for me. Made for me. One of the interesting things about Muslim Mission Art was that it was specifically an online project. It, it allowed me to disentangle my embodiments with my expressions. I didn't look a certain way, I didn't act a certain way, and I always passed on the internet. Um, and I was able... Oops, that's not right. I was able, essentially to treat the internet like a way to get that kind of idea and get that different presentation, that different context, out into the minds of other people. It was like, to you, to appropriate some technological terminology, it was like impregnating the scenes, spaces, with cybernetic replication. Right? Other people's minds, I wrote in the post, very angry about this very topic, other people's minds offered pre-sequenced cultural genetic material, instruments to engineer a more humane culture. So what I did was project my persona so thoroughly up there on the internet that I forgot about being a corporeal being. To get the fucking ideas out there. To make the space in people's minds where something like that was possible and acceptable. This does not just affect men who are submissive. It affects pretty much everybody, in various ways. This is a great post by Adele Hayes talking about uh, kinking, marketing, phraseology. And one of the things that uh, she wrote about here was just uh, taking a bunch of examples of, of the, the porn maker's uh, way of selling their material. Um, zoom in a little bit here. Sexy milk is bound, so made to carry a mattress through the city so everyone can see what a huge horror she is. And then she makes some very, very poignantly sarcastic, funny remarks about them. For example, T Blondie gets swept on the street by Big Black Cop. OMG, disembodied ethnically specific cop. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that was very good about this post, I thought, was that she called out the community of people who supported this, this as being surprised that in their latest incarnation, a particular incident with Nikki Blue's Virginia Duke press release, as being surprised that this kind of stuff went on from Jake. Oh my god, as if it was some kind of shock. As if they hadn't been reading this and consuming this all the goddamn time already. All, every day, that is, that, is the, that is the presentation. It would only shock somebody, right, if they were, if, if they were surprised that that could be possible. Why, why don't people notice that more fully? Didn't shock me. And it didn't shock a lot of other people either. But few people in the community, in the scene state, had much to say about it. Right? So this presents women, for the most part, or submissive men on the earlier part, as worthless people. But we are not worthless individuals. We are very valuable people. And the sexualities that we have are also important, valuable, highly subversive, and very, very useful. 
We are not poor people. We are rich people. And so that's why a lot of people are very angry, very angry at this constant refrain. Now if you ask seen people to fix this, they won't, because they benefit from the rotten status quo. The fundamental issue to recognize is that people who are community leaders, and I use Kinky as an example, but there are many, we can use the task board of directors or any of the other organizations as well. The thing to recognize is that these these, these scene state figureheads, these so-called leaders of the community, are plutocratic vampires. Right? They are vampires because they suck the emotional vitality out of the people. They're a phalanx of dishonest and untrustworthy, untrustworthy people who use the instruments of scene state power, specifically, to enrich themselves, their cronies, and exclude everybody else. Where do they get these riches? Right? By creating wealth and social opportunities? By creating these kind of sexual opportunities? No. No. They rake it off the backs of individuals like Mr. Cellophane, who you will never see. People whose only pattern for BDSM play is the fetishizing of lovelessness and exploitation that I showed you in that prototypical example. That's not wealth creation. That's wealth redistribution. Up towards them, towards the higher classes. Any positive representation, including simply representations, i.e. visibility, not invisibility, existing representations, is a valuable resource. It's made scarce specifically to the most intersectionally underprivileged populace. As I mentioned some of them earlier, people with disabilities, people of color. So Ms. Sidney, in this particular example, We're a fat positive imagery. Look around you. Look here. The Center for Sex and Culture is pretty good, generally. But still, where are the fat positive imagery? Pictures like this. Let's share a white What Where is that? It's never going to be in that like kinky and popular feed. It's gotten a few looks. <laughs> I'm following it. <laughs> <laughs> a few looks are good. So, to understand resources, you have to understand poverty. Poverty, in her seminal work, Ruby K. Payne uh, wrote, a framework for understanding poverty. She wrote, poverty is the extent to which an individual does without resources. And specifically, she wrote that resources are typically thought of as financial resources, but they're actually, that's just one kind of resource that people, um, that people have. It's a very obvious one, but there are also emotional resources, right? being able to choose and control emotional responses, especially responses to negative ones. Mental resources, spiritual resources, physical resources, support systems, whether institutional or social. Knowledge of hidden rules is a resource that she knows. Knowledge of hidden rules is like the customs of a particular group. Of people. How do you how, how do you really pass in a social group? You have to have an understanding of how to work the iPad if you're going to make if you're going to pretend to be a businessman. But also things like what's the level of noise you're used to? Poor spaces are typically very noisy and crowded, and one needs solitude and quiet to think. Says Chris Hedges. It's an important thing because the higher classes you go, the more space you have, the more mental and physical space you have. And then she also talks about relationships and role models as a resource. Now relationships and role models, she says, all individuals have role models. I showed you a role model for a submissive guy that I hated. All individuals have role models. The question is the extent to which the role model is nurturing or appropriate. Can the role model parent work successfully, provide a gender role for the individual? Is it, largely, it, it is largely from role models that the person learns how to live life emotionally. Dominant men have role models too. Many of them talk a lot about that to me. One guy, here's a post I wrote. 
Um, the 38 year old self identified dominant man. He goes to a lot of king parties. Lots of good memories there. And um, he says that King was wonderful for him, that company, King King was wonderful for him, because he saw manifested what had always been going on in my own head, which I was ashamed and scared of, and I saw that it could be done in an ethical and consensual manner, which is awesome. I didn't even recognize that I was dominant or sadistic until I saw James Mogul patterning a way to do that. Once I did, I could avail myself of the great educational opportunities that are all around us here, Bay Area. But without it, I would likely have remained someone who thought he was sending some people who inexplicably needed props for sex. And then he says, and in true trickle-down fashion, that is why we champion it to others. It, the education, the, the scene. Okay, all sounds good. It is good that he has romance. Where are mine? Where are yours? For the most part, our iconography, the thing that is supposed to represent people like me, are primarily objects of ridicule or scorn or derision in both the overculture and the scene state. If we exist at all, of course, right? Every time I walk into spaces, I take little image tallies of the images. Mission Control, June 11th, 22 women to one man. September 3rd, 29 women to one man. Image Tally at SF Citadel, September 27th, 24 women, one man. Image Tally Wicked Grounds, July 13th, 17 women to five men. August 15th, 10 women to one man. The full numbers were 10 to, was it, it's a 20 to 2. Right? We are literally invisible for the most part. And it kind of reminds me of this. It's a comic. <laughs> Not an invisibility click. <laughs> now, one could ask, well, what's, what's going on here? Why, why, is, that, why is that happening? Um, and one great way to, put, one, one great way to think about this is not just a matter of what, why, you know, what, what makes us invisible, but also how, how, what keeps this going? What keeps us invisible? So for imagine, imagine, for example, marketing a cell phone to a homeless mom. How, how would you go about doing that? There's no market for that because you're not going to have any money to pay for your cell phone, so you're not going to figure out how to build the best homeless, uh, homeless phone. And so I'm going to borrow from Elisa, actually, which is that this idea is interesting to me because it turns the tables on access. As much as the underserved population doesn't have access to helpful tools, designers and researchers and business people don't have access to those populaces either. How does a researcher go to a homeless mom and ask about what the best cell phone is? Where do they find those people? They're living on the margins already, so they're difficult to see. An analogy here could be, for example, food deserts. Right? If rich people only build markets where they are, where are poor people going to eat? See also food deserts. If only engineers who drive cars build highways, where are people who don't drive cars going to cross the fucking highway? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, bringing this back to sex. In her uh, post, Perverting Visual, uh, uh, article, Perverting Visual Pleasure, Representing Sadomasochism, Eleanor Wilkinson wrote on what she calls the paradox of visibility. Right? On, one th on one hand, it's good to be visible. We want visibility. See also male submission art, et cetera. On the other hand, she writes, queer politics has often assumed that increased publicity automatically leads to increased acceptance, that to make a change to the heteronormative world order, we need to take to the streets to make our sexual practices visible. However, this equation is often overly simplistic. With increased visibility comes the risk of increased hostility, too. Uh, this Dan Antilus, for example, that dominant guy, was very angry, ultimately. He asked why I didn't kill myself. 
we must constantly be aware, and Lord continues, that there is a very real danger of a parallel SM normativity, in which certain capitalist and consumerized conceptions of SM become the norm. Already the mainstream of SM has led to a heteropatriarchal version of SM becoming dominant. With increased visibility, there's also a danger we can begin to mistake the representation for SM itself. This is how it should, uh, uh, this is how, uh, this, that this is how it shouldn't always be. What is therefore needed is a space in which to make a public, in, in which to make public a number of continuously contracting and conflicting SM stories. Without any publicity, minoritized, mi minoritized uh, sexual cultures cannot challenge and change mainstream stereotypes. Now, Wilkinson was talking about this scene as in contrast to the vanilla world, right? The overarching uh, hegemony. But the same holds true for inside the scene state itself. Exactly the same thing holds true. Again, it's a fractal boundary that works in very much the same way. And it's not just me, in fact. Um, here's an example that I found really, really, really recently about people calling themselves V and M, just two bloggers that I found. And their coming out story to BDSM is very interesting. D writes, uh, sorry, M writes, uh, these little posts about face-sitting remind me of how all this started about two and a half years ago. We've been dating for over a year, and we just started getting into male-dominated camp. Looking back, that was kind of silly. I was still in denial about being bisexual and about being dominant, so that, combined with a week of erotic dreams after reading the story of O, made me think that I wanted to be dominant. Like I said, silly. By the way, story is a poster right there. The thing was that I spent most of the time talking from the bottom. D was a sub that just... D, D, D was a sub just playing at being dominant, and basically that meant I got exactly what I wanted with a pair of handcuffs and some dirty talk, which at the time uh, stuck to me just fine. What set me off was, uh, the, was the one night we were having a little playtime with an old Halloween costume of mine, and I was desperate to have my pussy. D, however, was just playing horny. He wasn't going to. At the time, I was wearing, I, I was wearing a leash and collar. That's right. Yeah, let's say again. She was wearing the leash and collar. And I surprised us both when I balanced his hand with, with the leash and sat on his face until I was satisfied. But suddenly, a regular Fred Lake was turned into my first dominant encounter. It was thrilling, and exciting, and deeply satisfying. I'd like to say I never looked back, but I am still working on getting through all the baggage that blocked my dominant aspect in the first place. It's complicated. I mean, this stuff makes it so worth it. Good, good, good. Um, the point here is that they were patterning what they saw first, which is totally acceptable and fine, and not a bad thing in and of itself. But when it didn't work for them, thank God they found ways to actually find something that did. And what if they didn't? Who gets left out when there are no representations that way? Like, they're lucky. And that is a very difficult hurdle for many people to overcome. As an example, I entered the scene uh, when I was 18 in New York City and I identified as a switch. And I do sometimes have a feeling like I like, would have fun topping. And I have so thoroughly felt disrespected for being a bottom and a submissive that I had said, fuck topping, I'm going to do this. Maybe I'm contrarian to an nth degree, I don't know. But it was so important for me now, it is so important for me now, to accept this for who I am today, and that topping is not even in my head. And that fact also pisses me off. Because I should be able to be free enough, maybe I have to make myself free in some woo-woo way, <laughs> to want and have that too. And I can't get over that yet. Because that no one's perfect, I'm not perfect. There's an interesting point about representation. When I was uh, given pre-publication access to a post that a friend of mine was writing, um, she had given, uh, uh, also here. Uh, she had given me access to, to take a look at the post, and one of the uh, dominant uh, identified uh, heterosexual cis male uh, tops, who um, she also gave access to for another perspective, you know, said, I, I don't know if this, if, on, on this topic, he said, I don't know if this really makes sense. You know, I can name a dozen prominent submissive men in the scene, and only like, you know, four or five who are in the inner circles of like the kink kink symptoms. Um, and I challenged him, and I said, well, please name these prominent submissive men. And he came back and he named, he named four, one of which uh, uh, was uh, Manet. He didn't realize he was talking to me. Um, <laughs> uh, one of which um, uh, wasn't around anymore, his words. 
Um, one of which, uh, and two, and the other two who both self-identify as, as switches. So this is not a surprise. I mean, I, I said, okay, that is, you know, uh, one, actually, not 12. So you can either, you're either counting wrong, or, uh, or what you thought of were non-dominant men, which is a valid thing to, to think about, but not the same. And what's interesting to me about you know, the not the same is we have so many specializations now Right, so this 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 continued specialization of of, of sexuality, as, as Ella was talking about earlier, created these incredibly segmented populaces, which we, which which for some reason we 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 taken on to 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 some kind of nth degree of 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 essentialism, as that is that is what's what's important to be, and I suffer from that now too. See also, user identifier switch. So with no role models, how do submissive men play? Right? How, how do we learn to play? When people, when, when children grow, and when, when when animals are like you know in their like little nests and they're they're like biting one another's ears, right? They're not actually biting one another's ears. They're gonna figure out how to hunt. What, what is our version of that without role models? Um, what is the Luddic circle in which this can be safe for us? Let's call back. So. Back to the ethnographies, because um, these are really good, I promise. Um, on social status, as an overview, uh, Numar writes, through the acquisition and demonstration of specialized skills, the members of this community achieve social and interpersonal status. The paths of status, moreover, are clear and unambiguous. If members play well and get involved, they are all but guaranteed a high status in the community. In turn, this status confers desirability as a play partner, which is experienced by some as sexual romantic desirability. Framing SM as a serious leisure pursuit shifts the focus away from the ultimately unhelpful questions about whether SM is or is not deviant sex and allows us to understand SM as most fundamentally social behavior. And that's really important. Um, now, Conferring status, desirability as a, as, a, as a partner. Play kind of becomes both labor in the, in the capitalist sense and capital in the capitalist sense in the scene. It kind of looks like this. There's an economy that goes on in the scene. And it sort of looks like this. And I apologize again for not having the best presentation. <laughs> this is very crude. I didn't know that. But what I call the BDSM scene state work play economy looks something like this. And again, it's reductive. All frameworks are. Now, we have at A, we're playing or seeing, right? And I'll get into a little bit more of this in a bit. Uh, but Weiss, uh, in 2006, again, working at play, discusses this concept very, very articulately about how labor uh, is a kind of playing in the scene. Um, if you play, you earn status, or what Weber calls sin, right? As a player, if the play is good. You want to then talk a little bit about this. Playing confers social capital. Uh, but you also get, can get social capital by volunteering at local events, hosting play parties, teaching workshops, being recognized, being notable. I should point myself out as being someone who has social capital for being very upset about all this. <laughs> uh, that earns you access to play, which is its own capital. Right? You can get, for example, these can be tangible, like invitations to parties, discounts to events, and things like that. Uh, access to conferences, because you're speaking at them. Which then, of course, leads to more play, which leads to the player's good more status, and on and on and on and on the cycle goes. Now you can enter this cycle in one of two main ways. You can sort of start at point A, and you're more likely to start at point A by playing if you're conventionally attractive, if you're female identified, and if you're a bottom, and if those all things all line up. And you're more likely to start at C, if you're less conventionally attractive, you're male identified or presenting, or a top. Let's um, play a little bit more, because play is kind of widely misunderstood from this kind of class perspective, but it's really important, especially when it comes to social classes. Play itself is classed in the scene. Right? Different kinds of play are heavier, harder, more expert, and there's some valid reasons for this. It can be harder to do, technically, and so technical skill becomes a kind of very specific uh, a kind of uh, a capital resource. So, uh, uh, and by capital resource, I specifically mean social capital resource. Um, again, Weiss is really articulate around this. And 
she writes on the notion of play as capital. Um, so as BDSM has become more mainstream, more organizationally focused, and more middle class, practitioners work on their SM in self-conscious ways, mobilizing American discourses of self-improvement, actualization, and education. See also techniques and skills and classes and workshops and all that stuff. But it's also recombinative. It's also, it plays also not just a way to uh, enjoy oneself recreationally, but it's also recreating the kinds of social contracts that we're able to have with one another. And again, Ella talked about this really well earlier. Um, and as such, it becomes it become its own kind of alibi for power exchanges. Because you've created that particular logic circle where you can actually enjoy, uh, in a safe way, that kind of relationship with somebody else. Um, Access to play, on the other hand, is a form of capital, and Newmar is particularly uh, going in about this. So on on playing, uh, sorry, on on play, playing first. We're gonna. Much of the appeal of topping is in the sense of epic efficacy. The observable and immediate response of the bottom contributes significantly to the enjoyment of play by tops. Most tops consider themselves reaction junkies. A bottom who moans, yelps, screams, laughs, wriggles, and rides is thus more desirable than one who is stoic during play, all else being equal. And just for a moment, I'm going to tangent into, and why are men who bottom specifically supposed to be stoic then? <laughs> what is with the silent men? <laughs> They're taught that. There's a pattern. Even to their own detriment. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, bottoms with a high pain tolerance allow for more creativity, less sensitiveness on top of part of top. Um, bottoms who are edgy or extreme in their SM activity tend to have higher social status than those who are not. For the same reason as that line about bottoms who have fewer limits provide their partners with more possibilities and often the opportunity to engage in play uh, in which most others are interested. Right? Tops achieve status again through, through skills, techniques, etc. On access to play, this comes back to the volunteerism, right? We go from that side. Status as a volunteer. To enter a status as a volunteer, to enter the, the, the scene uh, work play economy that way, it's particularly advantageous for people who top. Because of safety concerns, novices who bottom have less difficulty finding play partners than those who top. This results in faster access to status through play for bottoms, but also serves to track tops as volunteers. Volunteerism can result in increased access to play, which helps to mitigate the disadvantage top space on the path to status in the community. It also contributes to an imbalance between tops and bottoms at the level of community leadership because most participants want to play soon after they enter the scene and because most bottoms do not need to become involved in order to, play, to obtain play. The result is the cultivation of tops as community leaders far more frequently than bottoms. How, when was the last time you saw a presentation by a bottom for a bottom? And in comparison to how many presentations by tops for tops? For those of you who are in such spaces. Okay, so when we talk about this, when we think of barbarian stratification as, as, a, as a way to, 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 to segment a populace within the scene, we can see who have access to lots of play equipment, et cetera, are, are, are one, have one component of high status. People who are dominants and tops uh, tend to have another status, their, their stand, their social role orientation. Um, and, and of course, their party political affiliation, that, that, that's not it. So then people like the ones who are at, the, the, the ones who have, coupled with the, the, the volunteerism, tra tracking tops as, as community leaders, you have typically in this pansex, so-called pansexual community, dominant men who are white, and able-bodied, and community leaders, and they have decision-making roles at boards like the test board, at places, many places like the Society of Dennis, and King King as well. James Lowell was a dominant guy. He was in Lyndon Payne for God knows how many years. Um, so we can look at those as high-class individuals. Right? We can have, like, you know, there's the working people, high-class, like the bourgeois, et cetera, if you want to go all academic. Um, then we have the proletariat, the working class. These are like teen regulars and so on and so forth. And so again, the question becomes, well, who, who gets that back? Who, who, who's wearing the invisible cloak? So okay, examples of this, right? Let's look at how this play economy works 
in the scene. And again, I'm using King King as an example, but there are, there are many others. King King is just very visible and also a good example because people get very, people like talking about them and then I get a lot of attention for having talked about them, which is really important to get this fucking idea out there. Um, as an example, King King's parties, especially the upper floor parties, have a lot of, they, they give free entry to community members, right? They sleep in the community itself to play, generating labor, which then literally they transform to capital. <laughs> literally. And if you're not getting paid, you're not the customer. You're a product. It kind of reminds me of Facebook. <laughs> like, really like Facebook. Like, like that Facebook. Right? <laughs> now, I should clarify, it's not wrong to do that. You have an opportunity to play. Good, go! Have a class. I'm talking about the systemics here. I'm not talking about the individual experience. I'm not talking about your particular experience. Uh, uh, and I'm talking about the way that this reinforces itself. The system reinforces itself. It's very, it's very fucking capitalist. Um, it's also corrupt. Now. <clears throat> You don't really have to take my word on all of this. I want to show you uh, this example by Flora de Lee, who wrote about her experience at the King and Gang Bang. All the guests began to ascend the stairs to get to the floor. We were told to help ourselves to red wine, white wine, and champagne. Shelley said that it was her understanding that the guests could participate if they so chose. She said that she had no interest in joining them. She just wanted to watch. Suddenly, we became very aware this was an actual flourish. We were all extras. <laughs> oh, right! We're a poor company. People were not really interested in the food. They were interested in the torture fire. Here, I feel like our handsome host was all. But since our hands were free, we should feel free. Blah, 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 blah. Um, this is all the sex part, which I don't really care about right now. Um, I noticed that these events fall into the category of mom and side after a while. Most people on their own would probably not just be able to jump right in, but when you have a table full of people all doing it, you suddenly feel brave. Guess we're getting more and more turned on. No reason to have trouble getting wrapped in rougher. We took a short break. No. Uh, well, what I feel like is, first of all, we're all pretty fucking drunk. <laughs> Which always makes things a bit more comfortable. Oh, it all escalated so quickly. I even re uh, I realized that my entire participation in this event was when I snapped play a couple times with a writing prop. My dear, this is the husband, and it's slob, and it's more upset. Um, at this point, I realized just how drunk I was. <laughs> just how late it was, and I needed to scoot. I missed out on the money shot, as they say in the industry. I took that room quickly and quietly without the the scene, put my coat on, descended the stairs, and headed out into the San Francisco night. Now, this is a particularly telling example because the alcohol uh, here highlights an incredible disconnect between a uh, so-called high class and all the rest of us. Um, it also highlights how the distinction between the corporatism part of this economy goes against and how the tension with the community aspects of it. I heard some of you going, really? Booze? Comfortable? Like porn sets? Yeah, that's because that's not allowed in the community spaces. Right? Alcohol is not supposed to be part of BDSM play. And again, as someone who has played with alcohol, that's not a problem. But the problem here is not walking your, your, your talk. King King likes to think of itself as great for the community. And the community likes to welcome them as wonderfully representative. Are they? Um, alcohol in the community is not just sort of against community norms, it's very against community norms. Not to bring up old stuff necessarily, here's an entry from someone who discussed someone who entered the Citadel not just sort of drunk, but shit faced drunk, staggering drunk. But he was let in. Well, I guess I won't name his name. He was, he's the founder of a very, very important. Uh, uh, BDSM website that starts with the name of Fat Man, with the name of Life. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and again, the, the individual encounter is not, not important here, but this kind of shit happens all the time. He's let in because he has STEM, he has social status, because he has access to social resources. Now, of course, this particular incident, everyone apologizes, goes over, fine. But that shit happens all the time. There is no due process at all in these communities. Not for any like malicious necessarily reason. Hasn't been developed yet. It's new. I get it. Maybe we should be thinking about that more.
Now, how often does this happen in elsewhere? All the time. There you go. So this is simple to solve on a like philosophical level. Either the community recognized King Kink as not part of it, or King Kink changes its ways to match community norms. Or, secret option C, everyone keeps believing in this polite fiction. Because that's just easier. Because then you have the invisibility point. These rules about alcohol, for example, there are others, police scene class more than they police safety, more than they have a, a, a way to keep people safe. All rules about sex police class as well as sex. And the community, for their part, are not just okay with this, but practically fucking sycophantic to these people because they have access to social resources. It's very much like the way an aspirational voter votes for Republicans, right? And then they're like, you're poor, you're too poor, you're, 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 you know, they're coming for your fucking social security money and you're still, you're, you're still voting for Republicans. Because one day they think, one day I'll be rich. One day I'll have access to social resources. If I'm just fucking brown nosy enough, they like me. And then I'll get to go and pay. I thought like that for a while. I know other people do too. You know it. And just like an aspirational voter, it's never going to happen. It's just not. Because it doesn't serve them. There are actual real examples of this. How am I doing on time? Uh, I haven't really stopped the time, but it's... Uh... 15 past eight. Okay. So maybe another like five or ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> then I won't go into specific examples of this, but you're welcome to look me up, and I'm happy to name names there too. Um, my favorite comment, uh, also on that King King Virginia thing, August Knight was uh, was you know first very concerned uh, about uh, August Knight who owns the Citadel was very concerned about what was happening in response to a post that was posted on Fat Life. Uh, Peter Apple responds very placati placatingly, you know, oh, everything's fine. Uh, her next take ends with, yay for a fantasy lift. Ah, oh, if only I was young and cute and in my 20s. It's literally sick of fantasy. So my sense on this is that the community's response to things like this mirrors the way that an abused person defends their abusers. Now, this... Safety fetishization, this idea that, you know, no alcohol in the dungeon ever, no alcohol with play, you know, all kinds of uh, safety rules. This um, started, you know, at the same time as, this, as it doesn't actually work, as it's not, you know, actually, as it, as it, as it is a uh, policing class, um, it also polices how people can get this kind of labor capital, how people get access to play in the first place. Because the thing that you are most oftenly told when you are not in part of the community, right, or you are interested in being a son, you don't have an attitude at first, is to go to the community to learn the skills to be, why? Safe. So you don't hurt anybody, which is good and like, an important point. But the paths all blind back to come to the community. Go to a munch first. Go to the educational workshops, right? But if you don't have the money for an educational workshop, who then? So, mostly in, in, in private groupings that are not this, this scene, people learn through peer exchanges because there's no formal structure. Now, there is a structure. Now, there is a formal scene. And Weiss also talks about this, about the, the rise of, the new, of, of, of what she calls the new scene. Um, most people were learning these, these, uh, scene, these scene skills on their own with peer groups. Now, with the scene state, it, it encourages classes. And skill itself has become saleable because you get to teach how to play this way. And there's a reason why education sucks in the scene, especially for bottoms. Again, look at all these previous prejudices. Um, and, mo and the people who don't have to go that way, every, when I was at the King Infirmary, everyone who I asked said that they found the scene through the company first, not, not, not the community. I was like, did, did you get involved in the BDSM community? You know? uh, how did you get involved in the BDSM? Well, I joined the, the company. So those are the people who are not part of this uh, uh, economic ladder. 
Um, so again, it's not that not that people are out for you individually. No one, no one cares about you. No one cares about me. People aren't, people aren't out to get you or me. It's that nobody seems to notice, nobody seems to care. And that reminds me not only of the George Carlin quote that I just, that I just quoted, but also um, of, um, of this quote by, by Martin Luther King. He says, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride for freedom is not the white citizen's counselor, the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative piece in which the absence of tension to a positive, uh, which is the absence of tension to a positive piece, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. It's the middle class, right? That's the systemic oppressors. They have numbers. Now, why was this scene state thing created? Because of an inf a population group called the internet. The internet thrust mass amounts of new people to, the, to, to this kind of sexuality, this kind of understanding of, of, of what they wanted to do giving them an outlet for it, giving them an outlet to express it. And as such, created that exact kind of organizationally induced resource scarcity. And this is also very important for notions of digital divide, where increasingly expressions of, of sexuality are coming to the fore on the internet, who not everyone has access to. Now, if we look at this specifically from within the scene state context, we can think of um, the notion of, oh, you, you, know, you shouldn't do BDSM, or you, you know, uh, or you can't do BDSM unless you can do it safely at a club, and with DMs, and, you know, basically lifeguards. Um, it's a little bit like hearing, you know, print is dead, which is the same as saying poor people don't deserve to be. So, as uh, Duncan, Laura Duncan was just talking about, right, is it a right, or is it market participation? What is what gets you this? What's what, what's what gets you in here? And the refusal to participate in the public BDSM scene is tantamount to the heresy of rejecting a consumerism in which play is this kind of labor capital. What do you do if you don't want to be part of the capitalist world? You live like a hippie in the mountains, I guess. <laughs> and the problem with that is SM is fundamentally social behavior. So you can't be on your own. It does not work. So okay, I'll close up, I promise. Things we need, right? What do, what do I want to see from this? That's all very, very doom and gloom, very angry. We really do need equal representation. And not just in imagery, but also in the presentations and workshops and organizational structure. We're not gonna get to a better place right, just by abandoning this. I might not want to save it if it were burning all down, but um, I do think it is actually the scene, see, it is actually a very important thing. And we do actually need to maintain it and protect it legally and politically and all, for all sorts of reasons. Um, it, is, it is the source of antiserums that will help make a sexually healthy society if we can actually utilize it for that and not just worry about getting ourselves off all the time. Um, we need to fucking acknowledge that there's a whole lost population out there, people who come to the scene and then leave. Why? Not because it was not the right place for them, but because it has absolutely none of their uh, 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 of their uh, of a structure that will actually hold there. there is no social safety net in the scene. What are, for example, the volume sales of BDSM related sex toys, like whips, for example, right, which are presumably used with partners, versus the number of people who attend play parties in those same zip codes? Where are they? You think they're not playing? You think they come to the Citadel once, leave, and then just are not kinky again? <laughs> and so, again, it is important to say, and all I want to leave you with is this, is this, is this idea that, um, that I got from Dr. Seuss. And he says, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, it's not going to get better. It's not. 
That's some good <laughs> Question was um, whether or not it, you know, a, a woman who was drunk would be allowed in community spaces. I don't want to speak for community spaces. Uh, like what, what they would do, I don't know what they would do. I don't know the future, but I can tell you that one's gender in the scene is much less important than these other factors. It's the intersection between gender and role orientation that makes a particular difference when we look at things of social justice from a social justice perspective. In the scene, right, because it is a space that particularly problematizes these ideas of well, only men are dominant and only. Um, um, women are submissive. We have transgendered individuals as well in the scene. We have people um, who are women who who, who top uh, and, and men who bottom. So the salient characteristic of an individual is not their gender, but but, but their their role orientation. Right, this, the role orientation becomes the status. So in the scene, whether you are top or a bottom is sort of almost more important. It's kind of like the it's kind of like the scene version of whether you are a man or a woman and whether you get privilege based on that characteristic. Um, and the other part I, you know, that I would want to highlight is it depends on all the social resources that, that one has. Um, it's not just social capital. That is, I think, the most important one in the scene state, um, specifically because it doesn't have a formal economy as such, uh, like, like a currency economy. Reputation is currency in the scene. If you get a bad reputation, you're not going to get access to play. right? So it's much more important to say good things about other people. It's almost actually a social uh, requirement uh, when you're in the scene, I mean, people people in the scene talk of other people's play like they're grooming one another, <laughs> because that's what it is. Um, so it depends on the various different kinds of, you know, it, it's it's the matrix of Weber's uh, Weber's three component theory that I that's the way I see it. I don't know if they would, but yeah. Um, a question and a comment in two parts. Um, first. Where do switches fit into this whole um, mess that you're talking about? Because I, there are a great many people who I know who are very invested in their scene identities. At the same time, there are a great many people who switch to one degree or another. And how does that interact within the constructions of power that you're talking about? That's a really, really good question. Um, it's, 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 I like to often... Um, related to the notion of bisexuality. Um, it is less the case now, thank God. This is one of the things that I'm very optimistic about with, 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 this, with the scenes younger generations because um, it is, they are putting a lot more fluidity into everything. So the question was, where do switches fit into to all this? And um, the answer is that they often either get read as top or bottom, depending on what they are currently doing. Um, in much the same way that if you're bi, right, if you're identifying as a bisexual and you're with a guy, and you are a guy, you will be read as gay. Uh, and if you are with someone of you know who's seen as the opposite sex, you will be you will be read as straight. Even though we all, or many of us, I think in this room already are very frustrated with the whole fucking gender binary to begin with, um, uh, and so that's that's kind of how it plays out. You can get, for example, top. You can pass as a top if you're a switch, right? And so you get the kind of seen version of passing privilege, right? Um, and if you want to take that. Great, use it and do something good with your with with your privilege. Um, you know, it's it's that 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 is what I would imagine. It is an ethical obligation to do so if you have privilege um, to do something good. Not just don't just be good. Be good for something. <laughs> okay, um, last question. Yeah. Would you consider have you considered starting um, a new scene or a new website for people who are not focused on social capital that are more intelligent and socially aware? Um, yeah, that sounds like a very, very energy intensive project. <laughs> have you considered it? And so the, what was the, so the question was, have you ever considered starting starting a new scene, etc.? Um, uh, have I considered it? Yes, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Have I uh, actually acted on it? No. 
Um, I sort of tried, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm angry. <laughs> and people don't necessarily, I don't, I, 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 I would probably be the nihilist. And that is not good for the creation of new things. <laughs> you could be the angry prophet. I could do that. Um, but, it's, but it's important, I think, for people to first, um, I think it's, I think it, you know, I see that there is nothing wrong with also being part of the scene, right? That this is, this is, this is a good place for a lot of people. The question that I'm asking is, who is it good for? Who, is it, who, who, does it, who does it serve more than others? And do people care? And if the answer is no, I don't care, then fine, don't care. I'm trying to find the people who do. And so not having had much of a other way to, to do so, I simply got very loud <laughs> about this particular thing. And it has attracted, like I said, a kind of social capital where I became known for this. I got my office from being angry about this. <laughs> this mission art was one of the best things I could have done to get to get people, you know, people who are sort of the other side of the coin to me to be interested in me. And the, 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 the thing that I'm frustrated about is that people who tend to then have that stop. Because their needs are met. Well, good for fucking you. But where is the rest? And so that that's that's where I see that ethical obligation makes sense. But I'd be interested in talking a little bit more about that if you want to talk with him.